Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. I'm here with Joe. Joe's here to help. And um, we're going to talk about divine mercy today. Uh, lest you think that this means that I've embraced some sort of modernism thing, I have all the radical radicals who I love very much, uh, are going to be freaking out that we're even doing a show on divine mercy. The reason we're doing this is because this is a show that is, act or this is a topic that's actually extremely confusing for a lot of Catholics. Um, and I'll give you an example of why. So here is the Christian Warfare Prayer Book. If you can see that there, the camera's focused on it. This is produced by, as you can see, Angelus Press. You got their little symbol down at the bottom there. This is the publisher of the Society of St. Pius X. In this book, on page 122 in the version that I have, you can actually see Chaplet to Divine Mercy. Is it focused? There you go. Chaplet to Divine Mercy. Now... Hold on a sec, because a lot of traditional Catholic commentators, some priests, not all, it's divided, have said that the Divine Mercy devotion is potentially kind of dangerous. There's some problems with St. Faustina, so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say, okay, what is, is, is there a consensus among traditionalists on it? Um, even if there was, is it accurate? Uh, before we continue, like this video, subscribe to this channel. Please click the links in the description to continue to support our efforts. Thank you very much to all the good uh, feedback we've been getting. Um, hit the like button and the, the notification though, so you know when we're going live. We're, we're, we're not we're recording right now when we're airing live. Um, but I will say, personally, I do not have a devotion to Divine Mercy. I did used to pray it a little bit when I was kind of like a conservative Novus Ordo Catholic, leaning towards tradition. I eventually, I never really had a deep devotion to it. It was just kind of what you did, right? In, in the average Novus Ordo parish, if you wanted to have a devotion. But my heart is for the rosary and has been for some time. And I just sort of, I got one devotion on the beads. It's kind of enough for me. That's kind of how I looked at it. Um, um, so I never really have been that devoted to it and have really many feelings about it at all. So this is why I'm going to take more of a neutral Maybe it's condemnable position by from the traditionalist side. And then Joe's going to sort of push back on that a little bit with his experience and his understanding. Joe, any preliminary words before we end up uh, upsetting both people on both sides of the aisle? Uh, so what you're telling me is that the Society of St. Pius X, Angelus Press, put that in their prayer book. Yeah. It must be a bunch of heretic schismatics. Eh? So once a, one, one, in one breath, they're schismatics. And then the other breath, they're heretics. Is, uh, That's right. Is what I understand. That's right. <laughs> Can't win yeah. for trying. No, I mean, uh, what I would say is, so I'm like, uh, I am pro divine mercy. Uh, my, I mean, my own personal devotion aside, I mean, it's not, I don't pray the chaplet every day or read the diary every day or anything like that. But um, right. I am definitely uh, fought, like, I, I don't see an issue with it uh, personally, theologically. Uh, I will, I will pray the chaplet sometimes I have. And, uh, Will continue to and i wouldn't um i wouldn't suggest uh doing it instead of the rosary uh yeah. i would say do it uh you know as a companion to the rosary you know uh, in, adi in addition to right. uh you'll see that uh a lot of the objections want to say that the divine mercy is trying to displace this or, this or that devotion when i think that's wrong-headed i think it's supposed to just be an additional devotion in which the church has many. And the fact is the divine mercy chapel that also happens to be very short. So it doesn't take long to pray. I think that would be the main contention. So like, let, sorry, before that, let's go over the prayers quick because you say they're very Orthodox and it's true. So they're very simple. You begin with our father, Hail Mary, apostles creed, obviously Catholic. Um, and you say, Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of thy dearly beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. This completely reflects uh, various morning offering prayers that have been said by Catholics for centuries. I offer thee all the masses throughout the world in union with the, you know, the sacred heart. So, you know, these are very normal things. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Uh, and then you say on the Hail Mary beads for the sake of a sorrowful passion, have mercy on us in the whole world. Perfectly orthodox, of course. Christ's passion is an act of supreme mercy because it's perfect justice, perfect mercy, so on and so forth. Nothing wrong there. And then the last part of it is taken actually, I think, from the book of the Apocalypse. Holy God, holy, mighty one, holy, immortal one, have mercy on us in the whole world. What's that called again? The, th the, thrice, the thrice holy hymn. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so this is, seen, this is said in the East a lot, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's in every Byzantine liturgy, you know. That's right. With um, the addition, I'm sorry, let me caveat. It's, yeah. it's uh, 
with the uh so when you say it at the at the divine liturgy it's holy god holy and mighty holy and immortal have mercy on us they don't yeah. add the the divine mercy does add uh the whole world but sure. i mean there's nothing unorthodox about that no yeah. like mercy for the world is good um okay so let's actually you mentioned many people see it as a substitute for the rosary that would be my main contention um in the Novus Ordo conservative setting, I saw so much fervor for the Divine Mercy and so little fervor, not, not in all cases, but more often than not, so little fervor for the Rosary. Now, that's not the Divine Mercy's fault. Hmm. Uh, that would be absurd for me to say that. Um, but it's kind of like uh, in this era of the new springtime in this post-Vatican II world, we see a lot of that where things that in and of themselves could be good are sort of exalted above other things that need to be kept as well. We see this in general with devotions and sentiments in the Novus Ordo world. I think that's where a lot of the criticism would come from. Um, but we can't say that if somebody is saying those prayers, which are perfectly orthodox, there's no reason why that person uh, should not or would not necessarily have a devotion to the Holy Rosary. In fact... Although the article, I have an article here that we'll maybe look at in a bit. It's from the divinemercy.org, which is the Marian Fathers, the National Shrine. This is where Father Callaway is from and so forth. Some pretty solid priests. Although the article calls SSPX schismatics in it, which I don't know why they have to do that. But anyway, it has nothing to do with Divine Mercy. Um, I hope that's not the official position of the MICs because I find them to be pretty good priests overall. But in any case... Um, they're clearly, they're the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. They're super devoted to the Immaculate Heart and the Rosary and are always promoting that. So again, there's proof that it's not against one or the other. It just, I think, has been taken as that. Okay, so I'm going to share uh, something on the screen here, Joe. It's it's the sort of most shared reasons why the Church has condemned the Divine Mercy. And then you have an article and some knowledge from beforehand where it might be in response to why that might not be the case. So I'm going to share that. On the screen here, I'm going to find that. Well, let me do uh, like St. Thomas does. Um, sure. The uh, So you said one of your concerns, and I, I've heard this from others too, is that it will uh, serve as a substitute for the rosary. Two things about that. One is I forgot the fellow who wrote the book, but there's a uh, there's an outline for uh, kind of wedding the divine mercy and the rosary. And uh, kind of saying them both actually uh, at the same time, which I uh, kind of I, I like the idea of that. I've done it before, but uh, yeah, I can see it's, that. It's it's just a, a, it's a um, as an argument, it's not very good. And the reason for that is, uh, there, like you said, it's not the fault of the divine mm -hmm. mercy. So it's not so that the issue would not be on the level of the object; it would be on the level of the subject. You know. Yes. So there's nothing. There's nothing in the meat of the devotion, in the meat of the diary or anything like that, uh, which would indicate that you should now replace your rosary with, with this, other than the fact that it's said on the rosary beads, which is what uh, people, people seem to think that that's indicative of why you would do that instead of the rosary. But uh, Is the St. Michael Chaplet on the rosary beads? Too, no, the St. Michael Chaplet's a little different, but oh, I, I, there, are, there are other chaplets that are said. Yes. on rosary beads i think one of the chaplains of the sacred heart is said on the rosary beads for instance yep. um well i think the franciscan rosary which is a little which is structured a little different would still be said on your conventional rosary it's i think it's seven decades instead of five so your franciscan rosary would still be said on your your uh conventional rosary beads as opposed to the you know our standard you know just for clarity our standard rosary for those of us who don't know the five decade rosary is uh, is Dominican in origin, not Franciscan. Yeah. Well, let's look uh, at this, for example. We have the uh, Holy Wounds Chaplet. And actually, this is called by some traditionalists who appreciate the divine mercy sentiment, but are nervous about the new uh, modern age devotion. And those are reasons we'll talk about, you know, problems with canonization and being nervous about that. Fair enough. But this devotion is called the Rosary of the Holy Wounds. By the way, if you want to go to the most amazing website that is like a time capsule out of 1996, catholictradition.org, uh, 
it's got the most amazing stuff on it. I don't know who runs it, but it literally has the same aesthetic as when it was in like grade six and I go to the library to use the computer, um, which I find beautiful. But anyway, uh, it's the Rosary of the Holy Wounds uses regular rosary beads. Um, yeah, it's on screen there. Um, on the crucifix and the first three beads, you say, well, uh, here's something very similar to that um, the thrice holy, strong God, holy God, immortal God, have mercy on us and the whole world. So we see this. This is old. You see this sentiment. Okay. Eternal Father, grant us mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ, thy only Son. Grant us mercy, we beseech thee. Amen, amen, amen. Okay. And the following, following prayers. Uh, Eternal Father, I offer thee the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ to heal the wounds of our souls on the small beads. These are the Hail Mary beads. My Jesus, pardon and mercy through the merits of thy holy wounds. This has been called a sort of original divine mercy. Not that there's necessarily a competition, but the point being is that this is definitely centered on the wounds of Christ, the mercy of Christ. It is old. It is, And it's also, as you say, just another example of a chaplet where the rosary itself is used. It We would not say that having the holy wounds chaplet should uh, replace your rosary. So you're right that it doesn't uh, work as an example of it. intrinsically the divine mercy replaces the rosary. Correct. So yeah. uh, another... Um, and I hate to be preempting everything, but yep. another um, in, in terms of the divine mercy replacing or substituting for other devotions, really the main one, the main criticism is not uh, it's the, the, that it would replace the rosary, rosary is an occasional criticism. You also hear and you'll see it in uh, the article, which uh, that I'm piggybacking off of and which you've read uh, that people seem to believe that the uh, divine mercy is intended to de-emphasize the devotion to the sacred heart, which uh, for reasons we'll see is not the case. And I think it makes sense then if traditionalists were to pray it. And again, I am indifferent. Um, it is in the sacred heart section of this book from Angelus press, uh, because if it is from Christ's heart, therefore his heart is sacred. I mean, it's very simple. It's not, it's not rocket surgery or brain science as they say. Um, there you go. So, okay, let's look at this article reasons to condemn. All right. And whoopsie daisy. Get you here like this. There you go. All right. So reasons to condemn. This is okay. So this was, um, father Perez. I believe he just passed away. God rest his soul. I, I think he was in the Institute. Was he the Institute of Christ the King? And then he became independent. I think. Sounds right. I know he, um, I believe he did some work with the Fatima Center, if I'm not wrong. He did. He did. Um, yeah. But I think he was from the Institute. I just found out the other day the Institute actually was started after 1988. I thought it was priests who left the society, but I don't think it was. I think it just started on its own thing. So different origins in the FSSP. Um, anyway, this is a transcript of his sermon. Okay. Uh, and so we're not going to go to the whole thing, but he says... The Divine Mercy was relaunched by John Paul II. During his long pontificate, he established a feast day in honor of this devotion. During his homily at the canonization of St. Faustina on April 30th, 2000, he declared that the second Sunday of Easter would henceforth... <coughs> excuse me. Please. Salud. Yeah, thank you. Be called Divine Mercy Sunday. This is another thing that traditionalists have an issue with as well. Uh, I shouldn't say. I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a thing that if someone were to have an issue from a traditional persuasion, this would be it because it kind of replaces low Sunday. Um, so there's a conflict there with the old calendar and the new calendar. Again, this is kind of just the mess we're living in. So that's not really the devotion's fault, but it's definitely the paradigm of this devotion. It comes off as in contrast to the traditional ways of the church. Okay. Um, and then he says, we do not do it, celebrate it, because it's not in the traditional calendar. Um. Uh, in any case, he goes on some other stuff, but I want to get to the point here why it's condemned. So, condemnations of this devotion. What is wrong with the divine mercy devotion, according to Father Perez? First, when this devotion fell under the attention of Pius XII, he was concerned not with the prayers of the devotion, but with the circumstances of the so-called apparitions of Sister Faustina and their content. That is, he was concerned with what our Lord supposedly told Sister Faustina and what he told her to make public. Now, this is a valid concern. Maybe you'll address this as we get into the uh, defenses of it. But this is also, I would add, not necessarily unheard of. Um, 
wh whether or not Faustina was a real seer, whether or not you know, we should trust everything she said, all seers come up against severe opposition to what they say, always. I mean, no one believes the Fatima children. Now, I know the Medjugorje folks would say this is why theirs is true, but that's very different because they've disobeyed like three different bishops who have ruled on it definitively. But um, all seers encounter resistance. And that makes sense because St. Paul tells us to test everything, right? When we have it, we have to discern the spirit of the thing. So if you say, hey, my guardian angel is talking to me right now and he's standing over on that side of the room, it might be true. You also might be crazy. So we should dis uh, discern the sign of the times, discern the spirit of the thing. This year's at La Salette. Um, that's an interesting one as well, which I think as we go through this, some people might not be convinced that Faustina had a saintly life. Maybe they'll say there's some problems with it, but that still too wouldn't technically invalidate whether or not the apparitions were true because there was some controversy in at least one of the seers' lives who saw Our Lady of La Salette and he had a very tumultuous, he was not a saint, let's put it that way, and he had a valid, saw a valid apparition of Our Lady. So, Here's Padre you... Pio, too, you know, a traditionalist favorite, was not uh, immediately well-received. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, I mean, hey, look what they put did to St. Joan of Arc. Goodness gracious, you know. Right. This is was... right throughout the history of the church. So we can't say that because it wasn't approved by a pope at that time, that that means it could never be approved. I'm just saying that's the logic of the thing. Um, okay, let's continue. Pius XII then placed this devotion, including the apparitions and the writings of Sister Faustina and Index Labor Laborum Prohibitorum, uh, forbidden books. That list no longer exists since it was formally abolished in 66. On the one hand, it's unfortunate that it no longer exists, but on the other hand, if it were to exist today, it would be so vast that it would fill this room. <laughs> That's true. Practically everything that is written today is something objectionable to the faith. Okay, so he continues. Pius XII put the writings of Faustina on the Index. That means he considered that their content would lead Catholics astray or in the wrong direction. I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, and, and, and maybe I am wrong. If I am, please, people, uh, help me in the comments. Uh, a book being forbidden does not mean that it necessarily is intrinsically harmful. A book being forbidden is that uh, it is it pre presents dangers to read this book, but it could be that we just don't understand it. And then eventually they're taken off. I don't think this would be the only example of a book that would be taken off of an index. Am I wrong on that? Uh, to my knowledge, I, I, I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head that was, was on the index and then wasn't. Uh, I, I don't have much knowledge of the, uh, the index in that way. But okay. uh, one, of the, one of the real problems with uh, what Monsignor is saying, in all charity, is... Uh, a problem of uh, modernity in general is that we use language somewhat equivocally and uh, yeah. imprecisely, which is, uh, so I refer to these as, as the word condemned. So the devotion to divine mercy was never condemned. It was right. suppressed. It was suppressed for a time. Right. Uh, Cardinal Adiviani, uh famous for the Adiviani intervention, which we all know, right? Uh, as yeah. trads. Uh, whom objected to the Novus Ordo, urged Pius XII at the time to, to condemn the devotion, the diary, the whole, the, uh, the whole divine mercy thing wholesale. Pius XII himself would not do this. He did place the book on the index. That's true. Yeah. Suppression, though, however, uh, is something that would be has a has a connotation where it would be more temporary yes. than wholesale con condemnation. The Jesuits, for instance, were suppressed. The Jesuits were not condemned the way the Protestants were. Yeah. You know, Protestantism is condemned because it is heretical. The Jesuits were suppressed because at the time, and even now, <laughs> they were causing some trouble and it needed to be addressed for the time. So Pius XII, and I hate to use a modernist buzzword here, but in the historical context was looking at it as, okay, this is a fairly recent uh, devotion. And St. Faustina herself lived in the 1900s. So they didn't even know what they didn't know. Yes. So he suppresses it. 
new translations begin to come out. Uh, Pius, so Pius XII is basically uh, acting prudently to say, well, let's wait well, this to, thing, make, the, uh, to make a final the, judgment. The translation, thing is, the translation thing is a big part, correct? Massive. Yeah, which is ultimate. Okay. The translation issue is ultimately what um, what gets it lifted off the uh, the uh, index. Well, not okay. not lifted off the index, but uh, the, gets the suppression lifted. I'm sorry. Okay, and and There's yeah, we would say, <laughs> um, you know, I I mean, again, even if someone was very anti the whole divine mercy paradigm, I don't know how you could condemn those prayers. They're, t- they're just Catholic prayers. I mean, there's, there's, there is nothing that you could prove that is objectionable about saying those prayers and appealing to God's mercy. So even if you were to cast out on the full life of, say, of Sister Faustina, fair enough, uh, but it would be impossible to say that praying those prayers with the intention of petitioning God for mercy for sinners would somehow be dangerous to the faithful, considering they're just Catholic prayers. So... I think that's, I think that's fair. Okay, let's continue here. He says, then came other prohibitions made by Pope John the Twenty Third, which is interesting considering John the Twenty Third. It's funny, you know, John the Twenty Third is such an enigma. Uh, I think he was generally speaking a pretty orthodox pope, but I don't know. Trads are they're bipolar on him, but uh, uh, twice in his pontificate, the Holy Off Holy Office issued condemnations of the Divine Mercy writings. Now that. I don't know if, I mean, they're saying by Pope John Twenty Third. it seems like it was under John Twenty Third. I don't know. He's um, used, and again, he's using terms equivocally. Yeah, I would say that. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know what those are, though, as well. Now, do you know if those were to do with what was the old translation? So if John the Twenty uh, Third. yeah, it would have been, it would have been the old translation that, okay. uh, that John the Twenty Third was addressing, he also again did not condemn it in the in the way that we understand condemnation. Okay, okay. So then here's here is he says not once but twice under Pope John the Twenty Third, this particular devotion was condemned through the Holy Office. Again, he's using that word condemned a little bit loosely. The first condemnation was in a plenary meeting held on November nineteenth, nineteen fifty eight. The declaration from the Holy Office issued these three statements. Okay, so let's go through these. There is no evidence of the supernatural origin of these revelations. Now, according to Father Perez, this means that the members of the Holy Office examined the content and decided that there was nothing there to indicate the apparitions were supernatural. Uh, In an authentic apparition, such as the ones mentioned here, you can look at the content and affirm and it can and affirm it cannot be definitively said there are they are of divine origin, but there is enough evidence to say that it is possibly so. On the other hand, in the Divine Mercy apparitions, they said definitively that there is no evidence whatsoever that these are supernatural. Hmm. This translates, we do not think that these apparitions come from God. Um, that's a little bit, I think, equivocal there. Uh, it's a compl- yeah, it's, it's a stretch. I mean, I'm, I'm just, and again, I don't pray the Divine Mercy. I'm just trying to be fair here uh, because, uh, you know, the... the um, Imitation of Christ is not a series of apparitions, but the author speaks in the person of God consistently. I guess the retort to that would be something like it's not it's not a professed that it is a series of apparitions, but I would say that the beliefs and the words of Father or Thomas A. Kempis are from God, hence why the imitation of Christ is used. I mean, it's probably the best bang for your buck spiritual reading in the church's history. Um, so I think that's a little bit of a stretch for Father Perez here to say that this is not from God. Uh, I think what it says is there's no definitive, at this time, there is no definitive evidence of apparitions. I think that's all it says. Uh, I don't think you can say anything more about it. He continues, no feast of divine mercy should be instituted. Well, fair enough. There shouldn't be a feast of something that is not approved. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 not really a problem. Um it is forbidden to disseminate writings propagating this devotion under the form received by Sister Faustina, as well as a tip of image typical of it. Okay, so that's one that people get to a lot. Talk about that one to us. It is forbidden to disseminate, disseminate writings. the writings and the image. Yeah, well, that wasn't uh, that was done away with after John the Twenty Third. So, 
John the 23rd was the one who's, who again, doesn't condemn the divine mercy chaplet and divine mercy devotion. He does, he does just that rather. He does, he, uh, prohibits literature images circulating, uh, that promote the devotion. Why? Because not because it's not from God. That is, that is, uh, that's a gross overstatement. As a matter of fact, I mean, this is, a. Uh, uh, just one one priest saying that he has an insight into what is and isn't from God himself, um, substituting himself for the church, I suppose. But uh, no, I mean, qu- quite simply, I mean, he, John the 23rd, waited. It goes into the hands of John, John Paul II. And actually, the case of the devotion and and uh, the, the images and everything related to uh, St. Faustina was uh, undertaken by, actually, I think it was while uh, he was Archbishop, uh, John Paul II, Carl uh, Watiwa, right? The one who is against these devotions uh, is Cardinal Adiviani, actually appoints uh, Watiwa to the case. And what we'll see eventually is the new translation, the translation errors being fixed, uh, more, more knowledge in that regard, and a subsequent lifting of the suppression by Pope John, John Paul II, uh, under his pontificate. Two things about that. One, I want to go back to Pius XII briefly, because John the Twenty Third, yes, he prohibits the distribution of the images and devotional material. But Pope Pius, and uh, I think it was, I'll pull up the year for you right now. Pope Pius XII You muted yourself. All that came through and it did it by itself. Uh, so Pope, Pope Pius XII is the last thing you said. Pope Pius XII in 1956 blesses the image. Oh, really? Yeah. So he blesses the image. The, one, the, the famous image of our Lord with the uh, with the blood and the water coming out from his heart, so Pius is that the original 12th, image. Yes. So the so the ones so that one of the examples the, the original image actually I believe has his wounds in it. Somebody might correct me on that, but so is it possible that since then the image that's been promulgated is sort of a derivative? Um, there might have been some some Let's minor changes. Up. From what I understand, Sister Faustino didn't care for the. Uh, care for the original image there's some context to that though uh that i'm that i don't have uh, near to mind but we do know that at that that point it's that you know we're in the middle of the 50s and uh saint faustino was uh was writing in the 30s so what's the original image you said there was there was wounds in it i can't find it it may be that there was there was wounds i don't have that let me see the original divine. The original divine mercy image is going to look quite like the one we know of now, though. You know, you're not going to see that too much of a difference. Now, one of the things people say though is you don't see the f- wounds on his fingers, on his hands. Original. If I could find it myself, that would be good. Image. Even so, Pius the Twelfth. Right blesses it regardless right so here's there 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 are some manifest um some productions of the image where the wounds are in his hands okay so i don't know if the original one does have it i I don't know that off the top of my head i would plead ignorance i just found uh this one here it's uh catholic news agency so don't worry it's a full in full communion source um (laughs) And this, it's actually called the original image of divine mercy. It's not where you might, or not where you might think. But anyway, this is the image. So this is the one that actually, yes, looks a lot more, funny enough, he looks a lot more Polish, uh, which makes sense, uh, you know, as a Polish. It's a very Polish devotion. And there is no, it's no surprise then that John, John Paul II was responsible yeah. for, yeah. For its now, meditation. this is the original painting from 1934 uh, by Eugenius Kazimierowski. And anyway, this, that's the one right there. So this is a little bit different than the average ones it's promulgated. Um, so there you go, folks. That's what it looked like. 
Um, then you have various derivatives of that going forward, right? Right. Similar images. But Pius XII, that probably would have been akin to the one that Pius XII gave his blessing to. So okay. so for our trads, right? So Pius, so trads yeah. often. Even the Sedes, even the Sedes should be the fans. Sedes, that, yeah. I mean, if, if anybody should be, that's the irony, is if anybody should, should have some leniency on the divine mercy, it's our friends of Sede Vicantis, whom I'm defending them in one breath and then defending divine mercy in another. But because um, Pius XII was easier on the devotion than John XXIII was. That's interesting. Going, going ahead and blessing the image, which John XXIII, does, you know, as far as we know, doesn't do. But mm -hmm. if um, Pius XII's orthodoxy isn't disputed... You know, I don't, I don't hear, you know, okay, so maybe, uh, you know, you might say he made a mistake or two in his pontificate, fine. But I mean, no, nobody's disputing whether or not he's a valid pope. Nobody's disputing his orthodoxy. And he does, he blesses this image. And I don't think if this was some horribly blasphemous image that a holy pope would have gone ahead and blessed it. Here's a real question, completely off topic. Sure. If Peter denied... If Peter did a public act of heresy, didn't he lose his office, according to the Sedes? I'm actually wondering how they reconcile. Like, I mean, he was re resisted to his face because he, as the Catholic Encyclopedia says, he uh, was teaching that you had to become a Jew first and then become... That's, that's, that's heresy. Would that mean he lost his office? Have we been without a pope since the first century? I'm just, I'm just wondering how far we go down the rabbit hole of the state of Vacantist argument, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, it's an so it's an interesting question. I mean, seriously, come on, guys, where's your line? I don't know. It seems pretty heretical to me. He was rebuked by the, the head of the Holy Office, essentially, which is, you know, and anyway. All right. So here <laughs> is... Uh, I'm sure someone's going to write an article now. Kennedy doesn't understand state of Vacantism, and he's an idiot, and here's why. Um, okay, so... Principal error. Kennedy Hall is a problem. I'm imprudent. I'm imprudent. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, here, okay. So, this is his opinion, Father Perez. Yes. Principal error it presents an unconditional mercy. I actually don't think that's the case. Uh, no, that's that's actually patent. That's like um, that's false in the truest sense of the word false. As in, he's yeah. uh, that's it's not my opinion here that he's false. That that's false. He's actually just wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> and I hate to be so harsh. But um, if if we know the well, uh, let's look at this. The yeah, I'm central sorry, error, the central error of the divine mercy, according to Father Perez, is that it promises lots of spiritual rewards with no requirement of penance, no mention of reparation, no mention of any condition. Well, even if that were the case, it is not necessary that every devotion touches on every aspect of the spiritual life. Uh, the rosary, the glorious mysteries of the Holy Rosary, they don't really talk about penance, um, I don't think. Um, really, I mean, just the sorrowful, really. I mean, maybe you could say in the joyful presentation, the temple, that's sort of an act of penance kind of, I guess, maybe. Um, but why, but, but that doesn't matter because the, the rosary mysteries were given for a particular reason to combat the Albigensian heresy. They have a particular purpose. So as long as they fulfill that purpose, that's why they exist. If they don't do something else, that's okay. Something else does something else. Does that make sense? Sure. And I mean, beside from the fact that when the uh, plenary indulgence for Divine Mercy Sunday, that's right. Confession is required. Yeah. The sacrament of penance is required. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, which is so if you want to call the, the plenary indulgence, the spiritual reward in order to receive the reward, penance is required in the literal sense. You need to go to confession and do penance or else you do not get the reward. Yeah. It's a regular, it's a regular indulgence. Basically. So I don't see where that argument comes from. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, now, but here's something I can get on board with of Father Perez's criticisms. And this has nothing to, well, this does and does not have anything to do with the devotion itself, kind of both. Mm -hmm. In 1978, the very first year of his pontificate, Pope John Paul II set in motion the canonization of Sister Faustina and the institution of a Divine Mercy Feast. Now, 
I don't trust modern canonizations. And that's just not my rad trad opinion, Dr. Kwasniewski, who I, I think still gets invited to Steubenville. <laughs> uh, he also says, he wrote an article in 2018, why we um, do not have to and should not call Pope Paul VI a saint. And he goes through why modern canonizations are completely dubious. Um, there really is no devil's advocate. There really is no assurance of infallibility. It's not the same process. I mean, yeah, he does a better argument. Everyone should look up that article, Kwasniewski, canonizations, infallible, Paul VI, whatever. You'll find it, 1 Peter 5. Great article. It's a great article because it, it really uses the Paul VI case as a springboard to catechize on the, or to teach on the whole issue of canonizations. Um, however, even if her canonization was dubious, that wouldn't mean that the diary or the devotion was dubious because it's not necessary for somebody to be canonized for an apparition or devotion to be true. Uh, again, uh, the, I believe to this point, the sisters who were, or, the, or Sister Mariana and Our Lady of Good Success, I don't think she's canonized, is she? Um, she probably ought to be. But I don't think that's, and I'm going to look this up. Maybe you can add to this, but I'm going to. I don't, gonna, I don't think she is. We've been meaning, and we've been meaning to get our friend on the show to discuss this, uh, yes. this, uh, this apparition, Our Lady of Buen Suceso. I will point everybody to the, uh, I think there's a channel that still has them up. I don't think he puts any more content out on this stuff, but uh, Vox Catholica yes. has uh, the talks of one of my old priests, and uh, I think he's down in Texas now, uh, Father Adam Purdy of the SSPX. Great man, great preacher. You'll find a series of talks on that uh, quite fascinating. So it gives me a second to, to plug his work. He's, he's excellent. Yeah, here, um, Mother Mariana. That's right, Mother Mariana. Yeah, Ecuador. Yep. Yep, she's not canonized. So. Well, th well think about it. I mean, think, think of the, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the cultus he's which surra surra yeah. surrounds potential canonization. Um, obviously, this popped up before. Vatican II ever started. This was a uh, de devotion to the divine mercy is from what I understand was actually starting to uh, have a kind of uh, uh, starting to get a kind of local popularity mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the second world war and whatnot among the Polish people. So obviously prior to anything that she had ever uh, heard going through any canonization process or anything like that. And our uh, one that's popular for us here in New York and uh, the church and the modern church writ large, uh, people praying and praying for and to, I'm sure, the venerable Fulton Sheen. And, right. uh, you know, obviously we enjoy his work and we pray for him and perhaps we pray to him and ask for those for those miracles. And uh, our good friend Al is at the forefront of that movement. <laughs> Gas <laughs> Al Gasman, a shout out to one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. Uh, so, but this uh, point is, is that um, if you're not canonized, it doesn't mean that you're not trustworthy. It's, um, they're, they're two separate issues, really. They're two separate issues. So I can say, and again, I'm just playing devil's advocate here for the sake of neutrality. I can say that I have a problem with Sister Faustina's canonization, potentially, uh, because I have a problem with all modern canonizations. Uh, but I can also say... That doesn't mean that I don't believe, and don't confuse my meaning, people. That doesn't mean that I believe all people who have been canonized in the modern age are not saints. I believe Padre Pio is a great saint. I'm just saying that was obvious, but despite the process. Um, uh, and if Fulton Sheen were canonized, I would be fine with that too. But I, I still think that there are problems with the process. We'll do a show on that in general. It's too much mm -hmm. to go into here. Yeah. But that being said, even if Fulton Sheen was never canonized, let's just say they, let's just say, the process being so severe and rigid or, and rigid in a good way, rigorous as it used to be. Let's just say Faustina or Fulton Sheen couldn't pass the muster in the old process. His books, are, it's still Fulton Sheen. His books are still great. You, you read life of Christ and you still weep at the beauty of the life of Christ. I mean, it's a fact. So um, Thomas A. Kempis, not canonized author of the imitation of Christ. Why is that? Because they opened up his casket to see if he was incorruptible and they found that he had, this is so weird, but I guess he wasn't technically dead when they buried him. So there were claw marks on the, the roof of the casket. So we, they weren't sure if he despaired in his last moment. <laughs> so they can't canonize him. It's like, whoa, that's a pretty high bar. Um, so and it is a pretty high bar. It is. 
it is a pretty it's, high it's bar. the point yeah that's the point but the book is the yeah. greatest i mean i think it's the most selling book after the bible in church's history or something like that so okay we'll go over one or two more things here and then you can give the thing because we have about 15 minutes give a more rebuttal from the article you have so i'll open this up here okay he says there's presumption in sister faustina's writing um the writings of the Polish sister Faustina herself published in English in 2007 pose cause for concern. The work has 640 pages and transcribes frequent supposed apparitions and messages from our Lord. Okay. Um, this is one she has a problem with. On October 2nd, 1936, she states, the Lord Jesus appeared to her and said, now I know that it is not for the graces or gifts that you love me, but because my will is dearer to you than life. That is why I am uniting myself with you so intimately as with no other creature. Okay, now, I would imagine that this exactly, um, this, as, as critics would say, is sort of an affront to our, our Lord's union with the Blessed Mother. How would someone answer that? I think this is a uh, unfortunate understanding that people have of uh, mystical writing, as opposed to... Uh, I, I've, I've noticed a trend among, uh, I don't want to say it's just trads. I'm sure it's, it's basically, uh, it's basically everybody, but, um, trads at times too will, uh, I think want their, want all of their reading to be didactic and read more like a catechism. So I've actually heard somebody say that you shouldn't read Dostoevsky. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, this I've is heard not to, I've heard not reading Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. And but both, I mean, I mean, Dostoevsky wasn't a Catholic. But uh, if you're going to tell me that you shouldn't read the brothers, uh, brothers Karamazov, or or even even notes from the underground, is pre Christian stuff, I, I don't. Yeah. Um, there's just not much I could say at that point. I mean, because you're just miss, missing out on just a completely vital aspect of what it is to Western be Western canon human. of the Western yeah of what canon, it yeah. is to be human. So yeah. I yeah I don't really have have time or patience for arguments like that, but. Uh, so the problem is, is that it, it, so it, it somewhat falls under that category of uh, of people wanting things to be instructive in the sense that it's like, it reads like a catechism. Who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? So on and so forth. Uh, mysticism is an entirely different thing, and most of us just aren't at that level, which yeah. is okay. We don't have to be yet. We're supposed to be eventually, but uh, we don't have to be yet. That doesn't mean just because you don't understand it or you don't quite comprehend the style or, or why that is being said, that, that, it's, that it's condemnable. Uh, so they're, they uh, use an example of uh, St. Catherine of Siena, whom we all approve of, right? Yes. And the language used of our Lord speaking to her. Um, for instance, here. He shall be one thing with me and I with him. She is referring mm -hmm. to herself and Christ. Yep. She's, I mean, so if we want to be literal, right? Yeah. You could say our Lord in the gospel said, I and the father are one. What's well, and name? Saint, Saint Bonaventure, the, the famous post communion prayer, uh, in actually in Saint Bonaventure's day. And actually there are Thomists to this day who are sort of on the, less balanced end of the spectrum will tell you that um, uh, basically upon a Bonaventure and Franciscan theology is pantheist or, or it poses a danger to pantheism because he talks about being dissolved in Christ as if we are like the Atman and the Brahman sort of mm -hmm. thing, which isn't true. It's an analogy. I mean, we have certain things in the faith that we know with precision, but then there is a lot that is ineffable, uh, because how, how on earth do you do that? I mean, how do you, how do you express, how do you express something that is mysterious and take away all the mystery? Right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an, it's a contradiction in terms to try to do that. Um, okay. We have seven or eight minutes here. I'm going to pull up this article that I sent you and we'll go through some of this to present the, the objections to these objections. We haven't covered the whole thing. I'm sure there's going to be someone in the comments saying, what about this? What about that? Okay, well, do your own show on it. Well, let's be, yeah, let's put it this way. I mean, if you want to do it to do a show or something on Divine Mercy uh, that's completely exhaustive, you would need more than an hour. Yeah, and we don't have that. We got, so we, we don't have that. We, you know, we all, we, Kennedy and I both have a life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Okay, so here's this. In defense of the Divine Mercy Devotion, this is from Michael Hitchborn, who I met down at the CIC. Uh, nice to meet you down there. I, um, we should talk soon, Mr. Hitchborn. So that was wonderful. Now, in defense of the Divine Mercy Devotion, okay. So is he a heretic or a schismatic or is he both? He's imprudent. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so reason now he's he's actually um, responding directly to Father Perez. Okay, and we won't go through all the preamble, but he's responding to Father Perez. So here he goes directly with Pius Twelfth put the writings on the index. Okay. So do you? Um, I'll read it. However, this is not exactly what happened. Cardinal Taviani, then head of the congregation. CDF attempted to persuade Pius XII to sign a letter condemning the Divine Mercy. Instead, the Divine Mercy was uh, placed on the index of prohibited books. That's different if it's not forbidden books, if that's true. This is not the same thing as condemnation. The same Pope incidentally placed, blessed an image, as you said. Okay. Furthermore, Pope John XXIII did not condemn the Diary of Devotion. However, the office under his direction forbade circulation of images and writings that promote devotion to the divine mercy in the forms proposed by Sister Faustina. Uh, so it's suppression, not condemnation. Um, and uh, it also can be considered, a, it cannot be considered mere coincidence that this was actually predicted in her diary. And she said, apparently, I've never read it, but here she says, there will be a, there'll come a time when this work, which God is demanding so very much, will be as though utterly undone, and then God will act with great power, which with evidence of, which will give evidence of his authenticity. When this triumph comes, we shall already have entered the new life in which there is no suffering, so she'll be dead. But before this, your soul, referring to her confessor, will be surfeited with bitterness at the sight of the destruction of your efforts. You know what, that, to be honest, that's part and parcel with... I think what uh, happened with St. Louis de Montfort's work, he said that it'll be hidden for like a hundred years or something like that. And I think it was found in a box in a field or something crazy, like just, Oh my goodness gracious. So these things happen. Um, let's continue with what, uh, what he has here. Um, Cardinal Taviani as head of the CDF was responsible for the suppression given the information he had at the time. His suppression was well-founded. As Perez points out, the Holy Office declared there was no evidence of the supernatural origin of these revelations. Okay, the caveat at this time should have been added to the statement. The lifting of the suppression of divine mercy devotion by the CDF says, this sacred congregation having now in possession the many original documents unknown in 1959, fair enough, and having taken into account the profoundly changed circumstances and having taken into account the opinion of many Polish ordinaries, declares no longer binding the prohibitions contained in the notification. If I could, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. So um, there's the statement there that there's no evidence. Okay, there's no evidence of the supernatural origin of these revelations. So Monsignor Perez then goes to say, interprets that statement. So it he never could be. Rem remind, yeah, well, let's, let's uh, emphasis on the fact that he interpreted it this way that this is not from god he takes a negative statement that says there's no evidence that that implies absence right? right absence of evidence and then monsignor perez says therefore this is not from god positively okay. uh that is a uh that it's a leap, it's a leap in logic it's a, it's, leap a in logic. it's a complete leap in logic it ignores the the idea of the ab, you know the absence of evidence is evidence of absence that's right which is not true, um, you know, uh, note to my friends who talk about canonical mission in the society. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's, it, it can put, it overlooks something to the point where I'm, I'm, I don't see how somebody could have ignored that, but I mean, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I would also say recently Our Lady of America, for a long time, it was under investigation. A lot of trads were friends and fans of it. Cardinal Burke signed off on it. But then now recently the, the ruling came down and said there's no clear evidence of supernatural origin. I think that happened last year or something, um, or earlier this year. Uh, but then again, that doesn't mean there's heresy in it. So even there, like, you know, it wouldn't mean that necessarily the, the writings of Our Lady of America are necessarily bad. It's just that they don't have any supernatural evidence at this time. And that's all there is. This is why, but this is why too, people... Um, you know, 
I did. I don't, I think, did I do a show on it by myself? I think I did. I can't remember, but private revelations are dangerous for people sometimes because they're private revelations. They are not de fide. You don't have to believe them to be saved. Obviously, if it's proven to be true, we should probably heed the words of Our Lady, pray the rosary every day. You should do what your mother says, you know. Um, however, and I got into a row with a traditional Catholic about this, who was basically suggesting that the Byzantines were somehow disobeying Our Lady because they pray the they don't really pray the rosary. And I'm like, clearly Our Lady understands uh, that the East has a different canonical tradition than the West, and the Rosary is a very Western devotion. Um, it is not the only way to approach Our Lady. It is the normative in the West. But it wasn't until a thousand years ago uh, in the way that we understand it now. I mean, these things do change over time. Um, so these things have to be understood in context. You know, people will get on the fat, and I'm a Fatima guy, obviously. I, I, I upset both the Trads and the Novosordites because I believe... It wasn't done under the previous popes, which upsets the Novosordites. And I believe it was done by Pope uh, Francis, which upsets a lot of the trads. So I'm just smack dab in the middle there, everybody's favorite person. Um, but there, some of the arguments I get from people is, well, how do you, I got an email the, the other day. Um, you have to admit now, Mr. Hall, it's funny the way people write to me. You have to admit, Mr. Hall, that there have been no fruits. It's been months. And I'm like, well, first of all, that's not necessarily true because Roe versus Wade is kind of a big deal. But also, I don't care if it takes a thousand years. Imagine if you said that, Abraham, come on, this promise from God. Where are your, where is your seed that is as numerous as the stars? It's been, it's been three months. You know, uh, we have no idea how long it will take for anything. It's an act of faith, and 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 it, the way it turns out will be anyone's guess. So anyway, that's just me saying. People on both the traditional side and the Novus Ordo side sometimes look at revelations, private revelations, as if there's some sort of super dogma, which can take them away from a measured approach to the faith, including all of scripture and tradition. What say you? Yeah. And private revelations, as we've talked about, I mean, can be a bit um, dangerous is a good word because it could be a bit, and I don't want to psychoanalyze anybody, but it could be a bit psycho psychologically dangerous because it's like, well, yeah. if you, give too much credence to a lot of this stuff uh not not in terms of truth but in your own personal life uh you're going to spend all of your time uh making sure your beeswax candles don't go out and your windows are boarded up for when the three days of darkness inevitably yep. uh kick off which they will certainly be tomorrow correct wow. um yeah you know are... yeah so so uh, you know and i look i don't want to get into the meat of that but the point i do the, well, eventually, maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll do another show on it. Yeah, we'll do a show. Dark. We'll do a show on that. Yeah, uh, I, I should caveat. I don't want to get into the meat. Of, I don't want see. I can't be equivocal. I don't want to get on, into the meat of that just yet. That's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that uh, you could uh, over, you know, and it, again, it's a question of emphasis. I do think people and it's not uh, I'm sure I'm somewhat responsible for this, too. It's not people's fault because uh, there's been such a, a dearth of leadership. Mm -hmm. From the top, obviously, which we all know about and have heard about, uh, you know, more times than we can count, uh, that we look for a kind of clarity on things yeah, uh, and a definitiveness on things, which is not it's not there to us. And, and that's unfortunate because it's not it's not the fault of the faithful. No. There should there should be a certain clarity on these things because we should expect the clarity from from the hierarchy and from the pope and from the bishops and so on and so forth. We don't have that. And I don't want, even want to say we don't have that luxury. We don't, we just don't have, we don't have something that is. We don't have that necessity. That is, that is vital for the life of the church. We're missing out on that. Yeah. Ice, and, cream is, uh, ice cream is a luxury. Having bread and water is a necessity. We don't have bread and water right now. Right. Right. So we are just trying to figure it out. Uh, and it's very sad. We're really having to figure a lot out for ourselves and become our own kind of John Milton. Uh, reconciling the way of yeah. God to man for yourself. That, that, yeah. that, that's, an, that's, a, that's a horrible thing to have to do. It is. So when, when the person who's against divine mercy gets very bent out of shape over how much they're against it, and then the person who's for it gets very bent out of shape over how much they're for it, that is because they're both victimized by, the, by people that should have clarified things for them and didn't. That's right. I think that's a perfect way to finish that. And I will say last thing, the prayers are in this book. No, the, the devotion to St. Faustina and the, the whole thing is not in here, but the prayers are, I don't pray it, 
but I have no problem with it. The prayers are orthodox. Um, last thing I'll say is I think clearly uh, the rosary, the Jesus prayer in the East, I mean, these are devotions that have withstood millennia, centuries, the, the, the length of time. They seem to be, generally speaking, universal devotions. The devotion to the Divine Mercy is very young. Maybe one day it will be something that's reconciled with people having a stronger devotion to it. Or maybe it will be relatively regional and, and something that's more strong to the Polish diaspora or something because that's just okay too. Some things like that happen. But there are plenty of devotions in the church. Uh, you're not required by canon law or by the, the things you have to believe to be saved to embrace any of them. Um, so... If you are curious about more, we can't answer all your questions here. I got a jet. It's actually my 10-year anniversary, so pretty soon we're going to be going out for supper. Um, so shout out to my wife for putting up with me in my ugly mug for 10 years. She's There's a cause for your canonization right there. Um, uh, but um, read both these articles. Um, I'll, I'll try to put them in the description. If not, they're on the screen. You can just look at them and use Google. All right, Joe. Joe's here to help, and uh, he did a great job again. And uh, ladies and gentlemen... This, oh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the links in the description, notification bell, all the things you're supposed to do. It's YouTube, you know, the drill. Thank you for all your support. This has been the Kennedy Report. And until next time, God bless.